Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Unleashed. We spent last weekend at the Western Conservative Summit and recorded a ton of short interviews that we'll be putting out as bonus episodes in the next couple weeks. In the meantime, the craziness in our country continues. The Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLC, declared Moms for Liberty, yes, Moms for Liberty, a hate group last week. The world has gone mad. This is ridiculous. To top that, California is about to pass a law that if you don't gender affirm your own kid, you're abusing them. And you can be held accountable for that. And you know everything that Gavin does in California, Jared Polis does here in Colorado. So it's coming to our state soon, parents. Let's start by talking about the Southern Poverty Law Center. It has long pretended that it is a champion against hate and extremism in America, but they have a troubling pattern of manipulation and biased labeling. The inclusion of organizations like Moms for Liberty as hate groups and Parents Defending Education in their reports is just one example of the SPLC's questionable tactics, which undermine their credibility and perpetuate a climate of fear and division. So first, they use clever counting and inflated numbers. One of the SPLC's most glaring flaws is their manipulation of statistics to inflate the number of hate groups in America. Rather than accurately identifying genuine hate groups, the SPLC casts a wide net that includes organizations with differing viewpoints, such as Moms for Liberty. By conflating anti-government groups with hate groups, the SPLC artificially increases the numbers to create a sense of alarm and to justify their existence as a watchdog organization. This approach not only distorts the true state of hate in America, but it also misleads the public and donors who rely on the SPLC's reports for accurate information. Second, they totally overreach. The SPLC's failure to distinguish between hateful and nonviolent political activism is a grave concern. By labeling organizations like Moms for Liberty as extremists solely based on their conservative views and political activities, the SPLC diminishes the meaning of extremism itself. Advocating against certain curriculum or government policies, even if it's controversial, does not equate to hate or extremism. It is essential to recognize the importance of differing perspectives in a healthy democracy and refrain refrain from unfairly labeling individuals and groups with whom we may disagree. They also thrive on targeting dissenting voices. The biased approach becomes even more evident in their targeting of -of right-of-center organizations and individuals by demonizing groups that oppose mask and vaccine mandates, that seek to abolish the Department of Ed or challenge the influence of teachers' unions. The SPLC attempts to silence voices that deviate from their own progressive ideology. This not only stifles free speech, but it also undermines the core principles of open debate and intellectual diversity that are vital to a thriving democracy. Last one, there's a big lack of transparency and accountability. Despite its significant influence, the SPLC lacks transparency and accountability in its operations. The organization's methods of identifying hate groups and determining inclusion in their reports remain largely opaque. Their criteria for labeling groups as hate groups are subjective and open to interpretation, leaving room for biases and ideological preferences to influence their judgments. This lack of transparency erodes public trust and raises questions about their integrity. So, while the SPLC claims to combat hate and extremism, their tactics and practices reveal a troubling agenda that goes way beyond their stated mission. And by inflating numbers, conflating dissent with hate, and targeting conservative voices, the SPLC undermines genuine efforts to address hate and extremism in America. It is essential to promote an inclusive and tolerant society, but it should not be achieved at the expense of free speech, intellectual diversity, and fair evaluation of differing viewpoints. Now, let's shift to talking about our crazy neighbor to the West. California legislation AB 957 requires parents to affirm their children's belief in being the opposite sex. It's deeply flawed and should be strongly opposed for several reasons. Firstly, this legislation infringes upon the fundamental rights of parents to make decisions regarding the upbringing and well-being of their own children. 
Parents have a national and constitutional right to guide their child's development according to their own values and beliefs. By penalizing parents who do not affirm their child's perceived gender, the state is overstepping its authority and undermining the autonomy of families. Secondly, the legislation is based on the assumption that young children possess the cognitive ability to fully understand and articulate their gender identity. The bill's sponsor herself acknowledges that children as young as seven can make such determinations. Seven? (laughs) It is widely recognized in child development psychology that young children are still in the process of forming their identities and are highly susceptible to external influences. Enforcing a legal requirement for parents to affirm their child's gender identity at such a young age is premature and will likely lead to irreversible consequences. Moreover, the legislation fails to consider the growing body of evidence questioning the effectiveness and safety of gender-affirming care. The bill's proponents argue that affirming gender dysphoria is necessary to address mental health concerns and prevent suicide among transgender individuals. However, numerous studies have shown that medical interventions such as hormone treatments and surgeries do not significantly improve mental health outcomes or reduce the risk of suicide. In fact, some studies indicate that transgender individuals who undergo surgical transition have a higher risk of suicide compared to the general population. It is concerning that the legislation ignores these findings and promotes a one-size-fits-all approach to gender identity affirmation. Additionally, the legislation disregards the potential harm and regret that can arise from medical interventions for gender transition. There are numerous accounts of individuals, including parents, who regret undergoing such procedures and suffer long-term physical and psychological consequences. By mandating affirmation and potentially opening the door to medical interventions, the legislation puts vulnerable children at risk without fully considering the potential ramifications. Furthermore, the lack of clarity and definition within the legislation is deeply problematic. The bill fails to provide a clear understanding of what constitutes non-affirming behavior or how it would be determined. This ambiguity opens the door for subjective interpretations and potential misuse, allowing anyone, including progressive activist organizations, to make claims of child abuse against parents based on their own biases and agendas. Overall, the California legislation is an unprecedented assault on parental rights and a dangerous overreach by the state into family matters. It disregards the complexities of child development, ignores the limitation and risks of gender-affirming care, and fails to provide adequate protection for the well-being of children and the rights of parents. It is crucial to oppose this legislation and protect the rights and best interests of families and children in California. And Colorado, you're next. So why is the left so obsessed with taking away our rights as parents? Why are they hell-bent on breaking up families? It's about control and power. Control of our children and power to indoctrinate them, to put a wedge between parents and children. Have you read 1984? If not, you need to do it now. And if you're a parent, you are at war even if you don't realize it yet. Parental rights are crucial in safeguarding individual freedom and autonomy and protecting America. Parents are best positioned to make decisions regarding the upbringing, education, and values instilled in their children. Allowing the government to infringe upon these rights can lead to a loss of personal freedom and the imposition of state-mandated ideologies and beliefs on families including yours. Parental rights foster a pluralistic society by allowing families to impart their own values, traditions, and beliefs to their children. This diversity of perspectives contributes to a vibrant and tolerant society where different ideas can coexist. Respecting parental rights ensures that children are exposed to a wide range of viewpoints and have the opportunity to develop critical thinking skills and make the informed choices as they grow older. Parents possess unique knowledge and expertise about their own children. They understand their children's individual needs, personalities, strengths, and weaknesses. By respecting parental rights, society acknowledges and values this invaluable parental insight, ensuring that decisions regarding a child's education, health care, and overall well-being are made with the child's best interests in mind. The recognition and protection of parental rights are essential 
for preserving the integrity of the family unit. Families serve as the foundational building blocks of society, providing emotional support, stability, and nurturing environments for children. By defending parental rights, we affirm the importance of family structure and its role in raising responsible and well-adjusted individuals. Allowing parents to exercise their rights empowers them to take responsibility for their child's well-being and ensures that decisions are made at the most local and individualized level, rather than being dictated by a centralized authority, as we're seeing more and more of. This principle fosters a sense of personal responsibility and promotes a healthy balance between individual rights and societal interests. Parents, this is a wake-up call. They are indeed coming for our kids. And as for the attack on Moms for Liberty, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. This mom on a mission is battle-ready. Are you? Remember, vote with your dollar. Bankrupt brands that are going against our values. Get your kids and grandkids out of schools that are going to the woke side. Keep your kids and grandkids scream time to a minimum and educate them about the danger of drugs, including pot and vaping, Adderall, Xanax. Our summer challenge is going on now. Check out the previous post to get some support. It's hard, but we can do it together. Next up, we're chatting with two amazing moms on a mission, my friend Tamara Farah, as well as my friend on the Woodland Park School Board. And finally, we'll wrap up with Ken Witt, the superintendent there. Let's do this. Tamara, I'm so happy to welcome you to Unleashed. Um, We've been friends for a long time and have been on the front lines of many, many battles together. And now you've just written an incredibly important op-ed in townhall.com about the battle we're facing to protect our children. And it is Pride Month. I want to talk about how we navigate this as parents and come at this with love and respect, but also that fierce mama spirit to protect our children. Tamara, can you tell our audience a little bit about your background and your incredible experience and how you got here? You bet. Well, I've been in politics and policy altogether for roughly 15 years, starting in my 20s, uh, working in crisis pregnancy centers as an executive director. Um, One of the first things, fast forward Colorado, that I did was run a congressional campaign and then went from there with a real heart to uh, help curb human trafficking or at least help put these perpetrators in jail and protect these victims, especially, uh, you know, kids under age that were still being tried as if they were um, prostitutes, you know, rather than being manipulated. So, so grateful for our incredible bipartisan host committee on that effort for about five or six years, passing some laws to define human trafficking. So I've kind of been somewhat project-based, but I have worked with a number of organizations, but at my core, I'm an activist. I'm a get it done girl. I want to make change. I want to empower other people to realize they can be change agents. Um, You know, I I like to say I never knew what I was doing with a new endeavor until I dove in and figured it out and did it, you know, and so I just don't want any moms out there to think, well, I can't do all that. You know, I couldn't either. You know, it's just it's a heart and a passion that can drive us uh, to learn and teach ourselves, learn from others that have done things before. And we can make change. You know, I always just ask God, what can I do? right? I'm only one person, uh, but surely I can do something, you know, and then of course worked for Americans for Prosperity in Colorado and um, had a PR and communications firm there too for a number of years. I miss all my friends in Colorado (laughs) since we're now down here most of the time in the state of Arizona, uh, another state that the left is attempting to co-opt Um, it's, you know, I would say at least a few years behind uh, the trajectory that our dear state of Colorado uh, has been on. And so connecting with a lot of people here that are really making a difference. And, you know, hopefully we can stave that off in this state, uh, which of course is is a very important swing state. Um, one, One of the top swing states in the country going into 2024. So we'll see how that goes. But, um, yes, i at bottom, I'm a wife, I'm a mom, and I care about people and I care about our country. I love our country. I love God and country. <laughs> That's I'm me. With you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. And boy, are things changing right now, especially for our role as a parent. And I'm so worried about this aggressive um, approach to our kids, the sexualization of our children. Um, and with all due respect, I have many friends in the LGBTQ community and love them and admire them. 
But um, as I, I talked to Vlad about um, my other guests on the podcast, it seems like things have gone too far. They're tipping. And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what we think as parents, our rights are being taken away and our ability to make good decisions for our children and when they learn about some of these issues is being taken away. Do you agree? I do. I do. So uh, in 2021, 22, I think it was 2022, early 2022, I was doing, uh, you know, some podcast basically type work called Women on the Right, regular video. So keeping up with a lot of the news and just a political commentator at that for that season right after COVID. And I was reading everything that was happening in the schools. And I literally would go on my walks in the morning and there were days where tears were just streaming down my cheeks. I'm thinking about what these kids are being subjected to. Everything broke open after COVID, right? When moms and dads were at home, kids were at home on the laptop and they were looking over their child's shoulder and they could not believe what they saw on the screen. Um, and I've talked to parents and worked nationally now in the last few years with two different national organizations now with Freedom Works Parents Know Best, which is an incredible education initiative out of Freedom Works. And honestly, my heart and soul has been there for these parents and helping them understand what's happening, how to be effective in working against it. So here's what I have recently discovered, because the big question is, um, well, first of all, let's define the problem. Children are being sexualized in the classroom. Children are entering uh, the doors of the school and they're being sexualized. And we're at the same time, I'm assuming there's a correlation that there could be actual causation here um, that kids are not passing classes. They don't, I mean, we had a whole high school that shut down their graduation because only three kids were eligible to graduate recently. And that's one of the most extreme examples I've seen. Um, schools are passing kids that can't read, that can't write in other instances. So what is sucking up all of the airtime in school? Gender ideology is a big part of it. Um, this is not about an adult choice. This is about pushing children toward an ideology that is not rooted in science, okay? Um, and the trans movement in particular, attempting to influence children to change their identity, their, their sexual identity, if you will, away from their birth identity. So doing research, and I've since found out that a number of people have been coming out with this. I didn't even know that. But basically, I see an example in Lukas. He was the education commissioner in Hungary, which was, you know, going Marxist at the time in 1919. And he actually was transforming the Marxist model to fit the West. He was the pioneer of that. He decided that a way to capture the hearts and the minds of the next generation, which is essential for Marxism, because the government, what, what do they want to do with their, pop, their populace? They want to control them. They want to make them into activists and little soldiers, right? Um, so how do you do that to a generation? Um, and they discovered it was, you know, of course, there were a lot of studies and things going on around sexuality uh, throughout the 20th century, 20, or yeah, 20th century. They saw that sexualizing children would separate them, obviously, from their birth identity, their birth gender, which is frankly the only scientific gender. Um, again, if someone wants to is 25 and they want to be a cat, I mean, you know, I might disagree, but it's a free country. No, these are children coming into a classroom. They're supposed to be prepared through li for life through academics, and they're getting a steady diet of this message all day, every day. Um, and so he found that that was a way that you could separate the children from their family. We see schools doing that. There's stories all over the country consistently. Don't tell your parents. Don't show the parents the gender, quote, affirming plan. Don't tell the parents that kids are taking um, hormone therapies. Uh, and in some radical instances, nope, don't tell the parents that they're going to get a reassignment surgery. This is how they decided to turn these children into activists. And we have been on a steady slide towards a socialistic Marxist type of governance. It's all coming, you know, it's, 
we're still under the banner of being constitutional republic. But if we look at the effective way that our government often operates, we see a lot of signs of those forms of government. Um, and so it's it's very suspicious to me. And for now, I am just hanging my hat on that, that this is the why that they're doing it. Because I can't think of anything else. Why else would they do this to other people's children? Well, and Tamara, in Colorado, Jared Polis has been one of the leaders on this front, mm -hmm. passing legislation that is slowly ripping the children away from our families and giving uh, much more authority to the government than to parents. And I've often asked that as I was running for governor against him. Why does he want to do this? Why? Why? He has children. Why would he want to put um, Colorado on the map as a trans tourism state? Why does he want to take rights away from parents? Is he really a Marxist, a socialist? Is that what he wants for our country and for our children? Um, you know, you've lived in Colorado a long time. What do you think about that? You know, I think the evidence is there. The evidence is there. Again, we have to stop and say, why? Mm -hmm. If someone has a better answer, a um, uh, an answer that is has more support to it than, than you know, my short little uh, expose and, and uh, discussion on, on where I see their support for this line of reasoning, then I'm happy to hear it. But I don't see that right now. I really don't because it is nonsensical to have an agenda to sexualize children. Who does that? I mean, it's just, it's honestly, it's, I hate to say the word, but it's wicked. I mean, these are other people's children. So they like, they want, what they want to do is they want to create this sense of, of shame and guilt on parents. Oh, well then you are anti-LGBTQ and so are your children. No, what I am anti, I am anti you indoctrinating my children on a particular line of thinking regarding sexuality, because that's not why I send them to school. So it is not the job of schools. I like to say that those conversations do not belong in front of the chalkboard. They belong around the dinner table. Oh, thank you. Yes, they do. And I'm serious. This is not the job of a school. So the fact that they want to make these poor parents in schools feel guilty that they don't want this happening is pure manipulation peer manipulation in my book. But Tara, most of the teachers I know are wonderful human beings and they love the children. They love being a teacher. What? How are they getting talked into teaching this stuff? Like what, how is that happening? Well, you've got just such a web there and I'm sure there are different, you know, nuances and differences to individual stories. And I, I agree with you. I love teachers. Um, I would love to see more, more really good quality people and for me personally, I'd love to see people of faith in the classroom. Um, but these supplemental lessons, lessons, I was just talking to, a, you know, interacting with one of the school board members here in Arizona, I won't even give the district. She said the biggest issue after I sent her my, my piece, the biggest issue is it's all, you know, supplementals. So many, uh, so much of this information, it, you're not going to find a textbook, right, on the LGBTQ agenda. It doesn't exist per se. Now we see a lot of the books in the resource centers in the libraries. Um, I would like to see, I hate to say this publicly because you know I'd rather say it privately, but you know, teachers should stand up and resist that. Now, now we might say, well, why don't they? We all know many of them need need their job. Many of them have worked as a teacher for many, many years and they're afraid to lose their job. Um, and they may, you know, so we. I have compassion for them with that. But if I were a teacher, I would find some way uh, to figure it out if I was in that classroom. Either that or would change my profession because doing this and presenting this information and providing these pornographic, openly pornographic books to young children is, is mind blowing, just mind blowing. No, and, I, and now they're starting to insert the argument that we're proposing book banning because we don't want our children looking at pornographic images in first and second grade or reading books that are totally age inappropriate. They're so wicked with their words. and their <laughs> They are. I mean, can you get the book on Amazon? Yes. So has it been banned? Yeah. No. <laughs> you can probably check it out at the public library even, but uh, you yeah, know- Yeah, it doesn't belong in the school. That That's, I, I think that's my, that's my- line that I repeat a lot. 
One thing I'm very passionate about now um, that we're at this point where in some districts, I don't think it's fixable for some parents and some families who are just not okay with the things that are happening is, you know, getting our kids out of public school if it necessitates that and school choice. And whether it's a micro school, a private school, a religious school, homeschool, whatever it takes, right? And I do believe there's going to be an incredible movement. There already is, but an even bigger movement for parents to do this. And we need to make it as easy as possible for them to have other options, to be able to afford those options and to be able to navigate you know, whatever's best for their family. But what's new and different on the, that front, on school choice that you're seeing as you um, move around the country and work on these issues? Right. I think these micro schools, you know, kind of little sh- smaller co-ops. I think when I um, chose to take our kids out of school and they did our do- I straight up homeschooled our daughter in junior high um, for various reasons. And then we had our son and daughter do online high school. That was back in 2011. And that was, I remember when I signed him out for the final time from Pine Creek High School, boy, it was icy in that office. I just felt them thinking, what is she doing? But I was so committed to doing whatever we needed to do for our kids that we felt was best. Were their parents Uh, we should be courageous and take that leap, do the research we need to do to protect our kids, to make sure they're in the right environment. I know we have two parent working families, but this is where these micro schools and co-ops come in. And a micro school can just be sort of like a small co-op where you partner with three other families, right? There's incredible curricula out there, online programs, You don't have to teach your child geometry. You know, you're at the kitchen table for 10 hours a day, sweating through physics. You know, you don't know that isn't true. Um, So just do your research and exercise that option. Do everything you can to protect your children. Um, And that is how I feel. Now, on the other hand, I understand 90% of kids in this country uh, used to be in public school. It went, it changed by about 10, 10%, which is huge. Uh, after COVID. Um, And I can't see it going down more than another 10%, frankly. I mean, there's always going to be a majority of kids probably in public school. The left is not dumb. They know this. They know that that's their best vehicle for capturing the hearts and minds of the next generation. Um, And I can't help again, but, but feel that it's to prepare them for a completely different form of government. They've rewritten history through CRT and, you know, these projects, just completely rewriting history. We know they're up to shifting and changing the way kids think, then they will change as adults. So, you know, I want to encourage parents, I would say, take your kids out. But I also have compassion for the parents and the kids that, you know, they just feel like public schools are only option. And my coaching there for parents is talk to your kids every day if you can sit down from the time they're little because if you try to start it in junior high we all know (laughs) you know my kids are adults and you know in their careers and I understand you know it can be hard to get kids to talk at certain ages but if you start when they're young you probably know this Heidi I'm sure you have kids of different ages Um, but if you start talking when they're young you know it becomes a habit and you can share with them I have run into kids that chose themselves to leave public school and we've seen we've seen some of that on TV too in different news stories. I don't want to be in this school because of what they're teaching. I mean, that's that's the ideal. You know, that's brave. Those kids are brave, brave, brave. I love it. Um, Tamara, we are in the middle of Pride Month. And like I said earlier, I have dear friends in the community, in the LGBTQ community, and I want to be respectful, but I'm also I feel like we're getting a bit exhausted from this constant um, overload of, you know, respect us, you know, allow us to do our things, live our lives. You can totally do that. But does it have to um, um, filter, put a filter on everything, every brand we see, everything we drink, everything we eat? It's getting a bit overwhelming. So yes. I know you're a, you have a strong faith. And that's part of the equation. Like, how do we navigate what's happening during Pride Month and the overwhelming um, talk and discussion about LGBTQ rights? How do we do that with our kids? How do we bring some sense of um, balance into this discussion right now? 
I, I would say first and foremost, we need to divide this conversation into two different categories. One is the individual category of individual people in our lives. Okay. That's one thing. The other is that there is a social and cultural agenda that is being fueled and fed by the government. Mm -hmm. And it's that agenda that is causing what we see happening now. And there are many very, very well-funded far left groups. Okay. Human rights campaign. I think you mentioned them. So they were founded in 1980 by the nineties. Uh, they were gaining steam and uh, they were, you know, influencing, if you remember, they first introduced this idea of gay marriage, which at that time was just no way shocking. I mean, people were, you know, even Obama, I mean, he was against it. Right. Supposedly. Um, so they know how to do things in a very planned, subtle way, but they lobbied for many years. They, they were giving donations, uh, you know, through certain vehicles, ensuring that both Democrats and Republicans received donations. Uh, and what was the ultimate outcome? The passage of gay marriage, normalizing the LGBTQ concept. Now we have ESG. And as you know, this is a huge force within companies and corporations. They are forcing companies. So it's one thing to just, you know, you're in a company, you're working next to somebody, they're gay or they're whatever. You know, if you're a decent human being, you're going to treat them with respect and go to lunch. And you know what I'm saying? This is not against people. This is against, and it, what we are, what I am is against a forced agenda that is bent on impacting culture and creating intimidation and shame in culture mm -hmm. that you have to act a certain way. I mean, Disney with the princess with a mustache, a guy dressed up. Why are they doing that to little children? I mean, it's, yeah, it's, that's where I just, I think that's my simple answer, Heidi, is to separate the two. There's two different things going on here. They want us to be guilty and shamed that if we don't embrace this huge cultural, you know, manipulation that somehow we don't like gay people, right? Yeah. No, they're not one in the same. That's, I like the way you said that, Tamara, mm -hmm. that was, that was um, helpful. Um, to wrap up, tell me a little bit about what you think is next. What's the next push that's going to happen? Um, what can we get ahead of the curve at all? Because we're always playing defense. Yes, we are always playing defense. Well, you know, unless we have a change in administration, which of course I hope for, I, I hope a, a strong Republican with principles and with skill. So not just principles that you talk about, but a skillful leader uh, that would know how to actually dig in and undo uh, some of the specific steps that have been taken, even just this executive order by Biden um, around LGBTQ, that, you know, and then the Department of Education's full buy-in, funneling um, resources. You know, you've got leftist groups competing uh, to be able to provide all of these resources around this agenda in the classroom. So it's a whole, it's a machine. So we want someone strong enough that can that can dismantle all of that and get back to a focus on education. Um, and so, but you say, what's the next thing? I mean, I think they're already doing it. It's a completely different topic, but for example, the whole green energy movement, right? We are fighting in it. When I say we, I'm not, I've been involved around the fringes with some messaging and coaching, you know, with uh, one of one of the organizations here. But in all across the country, we have these um, climate action plans, CAP. I mean, we could talk for another half an hour about that. But, you know, what's on the horizon? That's another thing. Trying to limit people's mo mobility. They call it the 15-minute city. Yes, Polis just tried to bring that to Colorado. That was his landmark legislation. And luckily- okay. By it's going to come nature. Yeah. It got turned down, but it's well, coming. It's going to come back. I guarantee you they'll introduce it next session. Don't you think? I mean, that's what they do. Um, but anyway, the point is that that's what they want to do. They, and so what is that? Is that the liberty and the freedom of movement? Is that uh, the pursuit of happiness where 
your own life is your own property and everything you own and everything about you. You have your own right to initiative, to live where you want to be, to go where you want to be. So when the government is is then restricting your freedom of movement, what are they doing? They're taking us down a socialist road. That's what they do in socialism. They control the population. Uh, You know, I know there's a risk of sounding radical by saying being this open, and this is the most open I've been, but I just feel like it's the 11th hour. We got to sound the alarm. You know, people are welcome to disagree or provide evidence to show otherwise. I'm very, I'm a very rational person, very happy to see it. Um, but it's very hard not to see the direction they're going when they want to limit your movement. They want to take away your car. They want you to share an electric car. They want you to ride a bike. Oh, but don't worry. They told the people in Tucson, we will we'll plant more trees so you'll have more shade in the 125 degree heat when you ride your bike to the grocery store, by the way. I mean, yeah. Can you see grandma riding a bike to the grocery oh. store? It's insanity. But the I read the Tucson Climate Action Plan. So it's, I don't know, you can't make this stuff up. No, and I don't think this is radical. I think it's it's becoming kind of common knowledge now. There's no conspiracy in any of this. It's happening right. before our eyes. Yes, our that's legislators. right. And if we don't speak up and stand up, then, you know, we're going to lose our country, which is, you know, part of the platform of Unleashed is telling the truth and lies about politics. So I want to end on a fun question and I'm putting you on the spot a bit, but is there a truth and a lie that you want people to know? We've talked a lot about these um, truths and lies in politics right now, but what's the one you want people to walk away with that they're just like, oh my gosh, things are really bad. Yeah. You know, I can't help but just point right back to these climate action plans. Um, The lie is that your life is going to be better because you are no longer by whatever the date certain is and these different plans, 2030, 2050, whatever it is, you cannot have a gas powered vehicle anymore. Um, Your life's going to be better. I would call that a lie. Yeah. (laughs) We have clean energy. This is a known fact. Um, you know, fossil fuels are a great source of energy, you know, so is, so is nuclear, but when you're powering cars, the biggest offender in the world is China. Yes. You know, they have the worst climate problem. If you want to have a problem, plus if you read, which I did the letter signed by over 500 scientists years ago, when they were first coming out with all this debunking the basis of climate action plans and saying there's no data that supports this, um, you know, 500 people plus, because people keep signing onto it, can't be wrong. How can all those scientists be wrong? They're from all over the world, right? And they say that actually we need CO2, Hmm. by the way, people, (laughs) because it supports our biosphere. Oh, those are our plants. (laughs) I like salad. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I hope you don't like um, steaks because those are going away. Oh, (laughs) yeah. And I can't cook them on a gas stove pretty soon. No. And they're apparently they're getting rid of cows um, across the world. So that's, you know, eat bugs. (laughs) Oh my gosh. The world has gone mad and things sure have changed since uh, we first became friends, what, a decade ago. I know. And I'm so proud to be on the front lines with you and in these battles. And thank you for all you do, Tamara. Um, you make a big difference in people's lives and um, we want to celebrate that. Thank you, Heidi. Thanks for what you're doing. Thanks for this podcast. I just love your strong voice. Uh, we need you. Thanks, ditto. <laughs> Thanks, Tamara. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Wow, do we have an awesome fighter here. Cassie, you are on the school board of Woodland Park, and you have been under fire lately. I want to hear what's been going on. (laughs) Hi, Heidi. Thank you for having me. My name is Cassie Kimbrell, and I am a school board director at Woodland Park, and it has been interesting. We've done a lot of different changes. We have uh, came out recently against the CEA resolution in support of economic freedom and the American Constitution. So we are for that. We, you know, we believe in the free market. We believe in school choice. We believe in just the academic achievement, and we want to push that for our children. And so our since this board has been elected, it's been such a 
like breeze to see. Our SAT scores have gone up, like the highest they've ever been in history. Oh, so, that's wonderful. I mean, it's still not like where we're like, striving for, but we are so proud of all the students, all the teachers, and all the administration for the work they've been putting in. We have increased our enrollment. We were one of the top schools in Colorado to have increased. We also are very proud that we ch actually accepted and chartered the first charter school in our district. So we have Mayor Academy. And so we have school choice for all, all of our parents in our community and for our, you know, our precious kids. That's wonderful. I'm so proud of you guys. And you've taken some strong stands on many issues, like around the mental health survey mm -hmm. and some other controversial things that our very left-leaning government is doing. And I know you, you have to run for re-election now, right, mm -hmm. this fall? I am. I'm up for re-election. So I've just uh, put in my can candidate affidavit. I've already started my committee, elect Cassie Kimbrell, so I will be on the ballot in November. And it's going to be a tough race, right? The teachers union mm -hmm. is hot and heavy. They do not like what you guys are doing, and they're ticked off, <laughs> and they are coming for your seat. Is that right? They, well, we have um, heard, and we had someone that did like a almost like a James Keith undercover video mm -hmm. where they came out and said that the CEA is offering like crisis grant grants and so they are doing that for the union but we have actually separated uh, we only had 30 percent of our teachers that were signed up for the Woodland Park Education Association which is the union which is the union but we have actually separated that contract. So they are not using our facilities. They're not using our emails to promote. So, you know, they can sign up. Or, and the dues are not coming out from our administration and from the taxpayers that are having to do that in the administration to pull out for their check. If they want to sign up for that, it's perfectly fine for them. Another thing that I'm really proud about that we've recently done this year was the teacher's life insurance policy was only $15,000. And we have increased that to fifty thousand dollars oh good and i mean and i would love to see that continue i mean it, i'm honestly a little ashamed that the teacher unions have not tried to advocate for the teachers more in this and for their benefit packages even their pay raises we gave the largest pay raise in history at eight and a half percent um, last year. So wow, before, that is wonderful. Yeah, it was just great to see that we really do care about our teachers. We care about our community and they deserve that because they are with our students and they were pushing them for their academic uh, excellence and so achievement. One other point, you know, we are the first public school district that has also adopted the American birthright standards for our social studies. So we will be meeting or exceeding the standards of, uh, for the Colorado Department of Education. But we're really pushing to just to teach the a traditional history of our well, America and that. be proud of where we came from. We are a melting pot. Um, I, being from Indiana, I have a lot of friends that immigrated into America. Their families did, and I went to school with them. And when you talk about that, they come here for that life. They come for America and the policies and the freedom and the economic um, support that we have just given them it's the free market when they can come here and build a job from being a taxi driver they could cleaning to owning a subway and then moving forward i mean it's amazing and so that's the american dream that we're all fighting for that's wonderful. I'm so happy to hear that. And I can't wait to see what you guys keep doing. You're starting to get national media <laughs> attention. I know. And you've got that badge of honor that everyone's after you. All the right people are after mm -hmm. you guys. So keep up the incredible work. And we will activate as many people as we can to help you and get you across the finish line so you can keep doing that. Thank you so much. And I also just want to continue to challenge and just support other moms and parents to get out there because it's really just, you know, getting your voice out there, being standing up for what you believe leave it and common sense policies that's really what parents want they really just want to educate their children get the reading the writing the math skills and all that we have great uh, just teachers and um, clubs our welding team is going to nationals i mean oh, you don't really neat. think of things like that vocab and uh, stem anywhere where kids students are gaining those life skills that they can take out into the field so if you're not wanting all those ap classes and college courses we're trying to offer different tracks as well so there's something for everyone
That's so important. I think uh, I interviewed someone else previously um, to this, Janine McKenzie, who does a lot of life skills training for students in curriculum. And she said, talked about the success triangle. One is, you know, graduate high school and college is a bonus. Two is get a skill, like something mm-hmm. that you're passionate about. That is true. If you have a skill set and you have something that you can take on, People love that more than anything. Yeah, and we need people with basic skill sets across this country. (laughs) I just had to get a plumber the other day, and I'm like, why is this so hard? Mm -hmm. And they get paid a lot. I can testify to that. Well, and if you think about the welding, we need some Marines. We're having a shortage of people that are able to build that, and as well as, like, aircraft. So welders are in need as well. So plumbing, any of those skill sets that, you know, micro, the dirty jobs. I love that. I love that guy. (laughs) That would be sharing all those uh, skill sets for us, so. Cassie, what's your background? How did you end up doing this? (laughs) Well, first off, I'm a mom, and I'm very proud of that. I have a four-year-old, and she's she's my why. She's why. When I started going to the school board meetings and sort of seeing the how we were below the state average in some of our grades. It's like, we can do better. We can meet these scores better. But my background is in just media arts and design. I did a lot of tech and social media, digital marketing in my 20s. And But when I came from Indiana to Colorado, I became a mom, you know, got married, we bought a house, and just really focused on my child's education. That's fantastic. Boy, we need a lot more moms involved in this in school board races and school board elections. And, you know, I tell people sometimes when they're like, oh, it was so hard for you to run for governor. I can't believe you did that. And I'm like, oh, school board, way harder, like, way harder. So hats off. Um, tell us a little bit about how people can support you, because I know conservatives all over Colorado know how important these races are. Mm-hmm. We've got to keep you in that seat. We've got to keep Woodland Park doing these great things. How can people find your website and help and donate? Well, my website's being built right now, but we do have our domain. It is CassieKimbrell.com, and that's C-I-S-S-I-E-K-I-M-B-R-E-L-L.com. And you can also find me on Twitter at Cass Kimbrell. Well, as you probably know, I was labeled a mad mom and a mom (laughs) on a mission during the campaign, and I'm so passionate about encouraging other women and moms to stand up and speak out, and I'm so proud of you. Well, thank you, because I am a mom on a mission. I love that (laughs) tagline when you're running, so thank you so much. Much. You're welcome. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to talk to you, Ken Witt. You are the superintendent of Woodland Park Schools, and you are under fire right now from lots of national haters because you're doing all the right things. Thank you for having me, Heidi. It's uh, it's great to talk to you as well. We are doing some very important things in Woodland Park, yeah. and quite honestly, uh, it's a small community of haters. It's a large <laughs> community of supporters who know that education has got to improve and we've got to put it on the right course and that's exactly what we're doing in Woodland Park. I am so impressed with all the initiatives you're taking on and the pushback you're providing to some of these really bad policies that are happening in our own home state. Ken, what's the most important thing that parents need to be aware of right now across Colorado that's happening in our school system? I think number number one is that parents need to recognize that they can should and must be in charge of their own child's education that they have to get involved and intervene when the schools are teaching in a way or teaching the material that they object to Mm -hmm. or that's undermining their own family framework their own morals their own household values i think it's extremely important that parents recognize that they can be in charge Hmm. we've seen some terrible uh, uh, legislative actions of late, including an attempt to allow children to be mental health screened without their parents' permission, and in fact, the school district keeping it a secret. This is, this is not what our Constitution intended. Parents should be in control of their children's education. So I do think that parents need to be paying attention to what's going on in the school district and be involved enough to actually keep control of and direct their children's education. And if they're not getting the education they believe is right for their child, find the right institution. Find the right school for that kid. In Colorado, we have school choice. You have the right to put your kid in the educational environment that you believe is right for them. So put the effort in and find the right one. But Ken, what if um, a family can't afford private school, they're uncomfortable with their public school, and they live in a district that's not doing the right things overall? I've heard a little bit about micro schools and, of course, homeschooling, and that's taking off right now, right? It absolutely is. Uh, I do work with another organization that uh, authorizes and allows to open 
all kinds of innovative educational models. Mm -hmm. And we, we authorize micro schools. Mm -hmm. We authorize some homeschool enrichment environments where homeschooling families can take their kids to actually get core instruction. We're talking reading, writing, and arithmetic, not just uh, socialization. Uh, imagine that. <laughs> imagine that. That's right. Even in a homeschooling environment, they can find the support if that's what they want to do. But there are still great charter schools out there. There are great neighborhood schools. But the point is, it's not just the closest one. It's the right one that you should be looking for. In Woodland Park, we, in, we recently announced the Total Opportunity Initiative. We announced that every parent in Woodland Park can get their kid in any school they want them in. We'll get them there. Busing everywhere. Really? Because so that's a huge drawback is if you don't have the resources or you don't have the time to drive your child back and forth across town to a different school, what do you do? That's right. Choice is only real if you can, in fact, access it. Mm -hmm. So we announced that we expanded our busing program in a way that every student can go to the school that their family believes is the right school in Woodland Park for them. Yeah. Um, why are the Democrats and the unions doing all of this? I believe it's about power and about control. Mm -hmm. In the long run, it's about politics. Yeah. It's about how do we ensure that the next generation only thinks one way? How do we make certain? They talk a lot about critical thinking, and then they try to ensure that it doesn't occur. And we want to make certain that our kids are taught to think critically, that they're well-informed, that they're fully informed about the government and the functioning of government and the freedoms that we enjoy, and that those freedoms are based on principles of capitalism, mm -hmm. are based on a free market, are based on land ownership and individual rights. And so we want to make certain that our students are actually well educated so they can understand how to reason about governance and how to protect their own futures. You know, uh, about a year ago, I think I, I was on the campaign trail and I went and spoke to a high school class at a very prestigious private school. And I, it was a government class and I asked them right off the bat, who's your congressman? Who's your senator? They could not answer. They couldn't answer at the federal level or the state level. And I said, what's the difference between a representative and a senator do you know? Didn't have a clue. And these are very well-educated children at a very, you know, uh, very high-profile private school. Like, what is going on? Are they just not being taught? Are they being taught the wrong things? Do you know? Well, I, I do think that there's a lack of focus on what government really is and what it looks like. Yeah. And there's, a, there's an awful lot of agenda to indoctrinate along one line of reasoning. And unfortunately, there's turned a hostility. The CEA recently announced that capitalism is Which bad is for Colorado students Education and schools. Colorado Education Association, the unions. Thank you. The, the Colorado Education Association, which is the teacher's union head for the state, announced that capitalism is bad for students, is bad for schools. It is the foundation of why we have freedom. Uh, so I explain to people when they ask, why do I have some friction with teachers unions? The answer is because they hate America. They hate America and they certainly don't seem to represent all teachers. Uh, they do not. There's a very small percentage of teachers that are actually members um, of most unions in, in many school districts. There, there are some where they have higher membership, but quite frankly, most teachers are frightened into being a member of the union because they need uh, liability insurance mm -hmm. or they need protections. And quite frankly, that's easy to acquire other ways. It's easy to cover that off. So most teachers that I know don't like the position of capitalism is bad for America. They don't like this anti-American sentiment that they're getting. So uh, I believe that uh, as we make identify and, and make opportunities for educators to be protected, well-informed, well-equipped, uh, without intervention with the union, that we'll see uh, much better outcomes for students. You know, when I was running, I, I got this statistic consistently from the state that 60% of our children, our students in Colorado, could not read, write, or do math at grade level. Is that budging either way? Is it getting worse or better? Do you know? Uh, the, the trend is not good, generally speaking, although the last year, of course, has actually been a little bit of a bright spot because we're coming off the COVID years. Sure. So there, there is an uptick in a number of places. In Woodland Park, we've seen significant increase in SAT scores. Oh, that's which we're, wonderful. Which we're delighted to see. Uh, but there is a lot of work to do, particularly in math across the state and in every uh, area that I'm, that I'm involved with. Uh, we're, we're behind. We've been behind a long time. And we've got to do better at instruction in these core areas. Uh, and it's not an easy problem uh, because it requires 
parent involvement. It requires family value, families valuing education. Yeah. And we have some larger systemic issues that are outside the school district that affect some of this as well. Like what? Tell me. Like parents no longer, you, you hear parents complain about homework. Now they assail schools for homework. Uh, you hear parents complaining that if they're in any way inconvenienced by the education that their child is getting, they, they want to hand the child, their child, to a school system and forget about education and when they come home, go play. Well, the truth is, 40 years ago in America, education was central. It was so important to success. And we're not seeing that same kind of family, home support for education from an awful lot of families. And we need to change that cultural shift and shift it back towards valuing education before you're gonna get great outcomes for many of these students where they're not getting the support they need at home. Yeah, I was talking with Cassie earlier on the board, and we were speaking about how to how do you keep people out of poverty. And I taught, I interviewed Janine McKenzie earlier, who does um, relationship workshops and curriculum for schools. And she said there are three things that will keep you out of poverty. One is graduating from high school, and two is getting a vocation and a skill that you're passionate about, and three is not having children until you're married. Right. And if you do those three things, you have a two percent chance of poverty. And if you don't graduate high school, the chances of you being arrested or being put into um, like drug treatment are off the rails, right? And so I think to your point about family values and valuing education, there are very big implications to not valuing education, and we're seeing that play out in society right now. We absolutely are. And uh, this lack of understanding and lack of, of uh, prioritization of some of the founding principles of this nation is playing out significantly as our kids are less aware of why the founding principles of this nation are what they are. Mm -hmm. They're being told that somehow it was errant or it wasn't optimal or there are better ways to do this. This discussion of equity in every conversation is getting this next generation to the point where they believe that communism is the right answer. Oh. They won't use those words, but that's actually what they're taught. They're taught that equal outcomes for everyone is the goal. And in fact, if you get to a, the communist position of everyone gets treated exactly the same, you end up with everyone poor and everyone oppressed, but no gaps. If you look at the history of mankind, in the last 250 or so years, we've made more progress than in the whole history, right? And what happened 250 or so years ago? America. That's exactly right. And it changed the dynamic for the, the entire you know, human race. People want, to, want the American ideal. They love the American dream. And we're slowly but surely allowing it to decay and fall away from us. I saw an interesting piece on some Armenian Americans who stood up at a board meeting against um, Antifa and some of the woke stuff happening in California a couple weeks ago. And I thought, you know, it would be awfully sweet and ironic if the immigrants that the Democrats so desperately want to um, allow into our country are the ones that save our country because they have actually traditional values and don't like communism or socialism and see right through the agenda of the Democrats. There's a lot to be said for seeing what doesn't work <laughs> firsthand. Ken, thank you so much for all the work you're doing. You are a warrior, kind of behind the scenes, and I wanted to give you a platform to talk about the work you're doing and the incredible advances you're making down in Woodland Park and statewide with the other efforts that you're making. So, Thank you very much for uh, having me on, Heidi. It's great to talk to you and catch up.